Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Confabulating. It's our great pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Sheila Ogilvy of All Souls College, Oxford, who will be speaking on the subject of economic development in Europe since the Middle Ages. Professor Ogilvy is a Chichley Professor of Economic History at All Souls College, Oxford, Director of the Oxford Centre for Economic and Social History, and a Fellow of the British Academy, Academy of Social Sciences, CEPR, CESIFO, member of the Academic Association of the Collegium Carolinum and advisory board member of Cage and Soul Economics. She studied previously at the University of St. Andrew, Chicago in Cambridge, where she served as a research fellow at Trinity College Cambridge and a fellow of the Faculty of Economics for over 30 years. Professor Ogilvy has also written a number of books and a large number of articles on subjects including European guilds, women markets and social capital, German economic history, state capacity and economic growth, economic conditions after the Black Death, serfdom in Bohemia, and medieval champagne fairs. She's also won a number of awards for her work, including most recently the Economic History Association George Ranke Prize, the American Library Association Outstanding Academic Title, and the Early Slavic Studies Association Book Prize Honorable Mention. Her main research interests include the link between social institutions and economic activity, economic development in the Middle Ages, guilds, serfdom, communities, family and gender, human capital investments, consumption, state capacity, and the economic and social history of Central and Eastern Europe. Professor Ogilvy, we are honoured to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to, that it finally happened since I think we tried to do it about a year ago, but that epidemic that has been turning our world upside down intervened. So it's nice to be here this evening. Um, what I uh, was asked to do was to provide a sort of brief warm up presentation for about half an hour, and then we can talk about the things that come up in that presentation. But, you know, if anyone has a question while we're going along, um, I'm perfectly happy to take it. Um, or we can flip back to the slides if, if anything's unclear. So I'll just make a start. What I was asked to talk about was economic development in Europe since the Middle Ages. And what I thought I'd do today is try to combine two aspects of economic and social history, which I think work together really well, which is on the one hand, quantitative research, and on the other hand, trying to explain the findings that the quantitative historians, economic historians, social historians have made. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'd like to start out with a brief um, set of questions. And then I'll show you some of the results of recent quantitative estimates on what's happened, what did happen to European economic growth in the early modern period, so since the Middle Ages. And then I'll point out what it is that we don't know, what the open questions are, what kind of things we should all really be working on now. So this is not going to be me telling you that you know, everything has been solved and I'm just going to tell you what is true. I'm going to tell you what we think is true and then I'm going to end with some open questions and that might sort of warm us up to talk about them in the second half of the interview. So what I want to do is to start out with the concept of the great divergence and what has much more recently been called the little divergence because I think that's really the the central question that economic historians want to explain. And I think the most important question that we're all addressing is there is in the modern world, as economists, we look at the modern world, very striking feature is the huge gap in incomes and living standards and most human development indicators as well as purely macroeconomic indicators between the continent of Europe and its offshoots, by which I mean North America, um, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, on the one hand, and most of Asia, Africa, and Central and South America on the other. And the basic question that we want to address as economic historians is, when did this happen? So is this something that has always been the case? There's always been this divide. 
or did it happen at a particular time over the last 100 years, 200 years, half millennium? And once we figured out when it happened, why did it happen? And in fact, I want to spend the second half of, of this presentation thinking about different ways that economic and social historians have used to, to answer the why question. So the starting point of this whole idea about divergence was a really famous book, really influential book that Ken Pomerantz wrote in um, 2000, so 22 years ago, um, which he called The Great Divergence. And what it was, was um, about the divergence in economic outcomes between Europe and Asia, which he thought happened after about 1800. And his argument was that it happened because Europe had two key characteristics. It had a lot of coal and it started enjoying what he called an ecological windfall because it took over colonies. So it could actually use the land and labor and, and, and capital um, and, and sort of silver endowments and so on in the colonies to expand um, beyond its own ecological barrier. Now, that was an incredibly um, influential book, it still is, and it kicked off 20 years of research. And during that research, an interesting thing emerged, which was to suggest that the divergence between Europe and Asia, and indeed Europe and the rest of the world, didn't just happen after 1900. It's actually a question for us early modernists, which is nice. Um, this divergence started a lot earlier. It happened in the early modern period. And so understanding the early modern economy, answering the question that we're looking at today is really crucial. The other thing that's emerged is that Europe wasn't a homogeneous block. So it wasn't, Europe was all the same and Asia was all the same. Actually, there was a lot of different, there were a lot of different regions and zones inside both Europe and Asia. And in particular, um, during this key period between 1500 and 1800, the Northwest corner of Europe forged ahead of the other zones of Europe. So it forged ahead of the South, the center and the East of Europe, probably starting around 1500. And this then, this process of divergence inside Europe started being called the little divergence because um, it was something that was happening not across the whole world, but just inside Europe. And the other thing that's emerged out of this whole debate about the great divergence is that maybe what mattered was not so much resource endowments or ecology as the economic incentives for using those endowments and managing ecological challenges productively and hence the role of the things that human beings do, the institutions we set up, the policies we use um, to, to manipulate the world around us in a productive way and maybe not damage the environment and so on. So that's kind of what came out of the, the great and little divergence debates. I want to show you some pictures now because you know that sounded really abstract, but if we start thinking that there are these really concrete estimates of what kind of growth record we're looking at. I think it will it will kind of focus our minds. And the first graph I'd like to show you here is the one showing the great divergence between, in fact, I pushed it back to the year 1000 forward to the year 1870. And what I'd like you to take out of this graph is first looking around the year 1000. So, you know, a millennium ago. Um, China was actually one of the richest economies in the world. It was slightly richer than Italy. It was richer than England was in 1086. It was richer than Japan was at any date between the year 1000 and the year 1750. Um, I'll just alert you to the fact that on that graph, the Chinese estimates are disputed. There's been a recent debate um, between Broadbury and his co-authors and Peter Solar about this in 2021. So it's really, you know, as I was saying, these are findings which scholars are discovering now. It's not something that's being sort of laid down. Um, so there's a lot of work still, still to be done. But as you can see on the graph, there's the bright red line, which is the Broadbury estimates for China, and the dotted maroon line below it, which is Peter Solar's slightly more pessimistic uh, estimates for China. So, but basically China was rich in the medieval period. 
The question is just how much richer it was. By 1400, things had changed a lot. Italy had become much richer than China. The Netherlands and England had become somewhat richer than China. And so it's tempting actually to conclude that the Great Divergence was already underway by 1400 or 1500, that it widened thereafter for the Netherlands up to 1600s of England by 1650. Question is, is this the right comparison? And the argument that a lot of economic historians have put forward is, well, no, it's not. And the reason is what is showing on the next slide, which is that China is actually, or was and is much larger than any individual European country. And so what we should be doing is comparing Chinese regions of comparable size to individual European countries, because certain Chinese regions may have been just as rich as the richest parts of Europe. So what we should be doing is comparing the, the leader zone of China and the Europe leader zone and saying, okay, that's the key comparison between Europe and Asia. And what you see on this graph, which comes out of Broadbury, Guan and Li's um, article in 2018, is that Chinese regions of comparable size to individual European countries may actually have been as rich as the richest parts of Europe. Um, there was a significant gap between the richest parts of China and the richest part of Europe only opening up after about 1700. You can see on this graph where the red line for China kind of goes through the basement and the green one for, for the richest part of Europe takes off. The richest part of China is the Yangtze Delta and that it remained the richest part of China throughout this entire period. A distinctive characteristic of Europe was that the richest part of Europe actually changed across this period. So it was Italy between the year 1000 and about oh, 1500, 1540. The Netherlands took over after about 1540, 1550 and remained the richest economy. It was an absolutely the miracle economy of Europe until about 1800. And uh, Britain became the leading economy after 1800. That is because of the thing I mentioned earlier, which is that little divergence inside Europe, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, because what, what this graph shows is the little divergence within Europe, which took place in that key period between 1500 and say 1850. You can see that at the beginning of that period, the South and the Northwest start out as the richest zones of Europe. But all of the zones of Europe are quite close together in 1500. So the South is rich because of Italy. The Northwest part of Europe is rich because of what is now Belgium, although it wasn't Belgium then, the Southern Netherlands. But after 1500, Italy and the rest of Southern Europe stagnate or even decline from about 1500 onwards, while the Netherlands, both the Southern and especially the Northern Netherlands, grows really fast. And England, as I mentioned, follows only after about 1650. Um, and the center, which is, I think, actually the center and, and the Nordic countries, was always a bit poorer than the other zones, stagnated from 1500 to 1800, 1800, and then it took off after 1800 for reasons that we can talk about later. And the East, which uh, the only really properly um, Eastern European country which has been, whose GD per capita GDP figures have been estimated um, very securely is Poland. Um, and as you can see, it's always poorer than the other zones. It did actually grow between 1500 and 1600. There was a sort of Polish golden age, but then, and it almost equaled the center of Europe in 1600. And then it shrank again, per capita GDP fell again up to about 1850. So the key thing to take out of this is look at where China is, the black dotted line there. The poorer parts of Europe, Germany, Spain, Poland, are actually really similar to China in this period. So you aren't getting a great divergence between all of Europe and China. You're just getting a divergence between Northwest Europe and everywhere else, China, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and so on. And that is actually 
the little divergence. These four zones that are shown on the map there, you've got the Northwest of Europe, the North Sea economies as the North Atlantic seaboard economies, England, the Northern Netherlands and the Southern Netherlands, the South, we've got very good figures for most of the Mediterranean era, area, the Italy, Spain and Portugal. And the center, as I said, is actually the Western central um, uh, center of Europe, which is France, Germany, and, and then the Nordic countries for which Sweden is the, the poster child. And then in the East, as I said, we've only got Poland. Poland was a bit poorer than the Czech lands, but um, it was probably richer than places like Hungary or Romania or Ukraine or Belarus, which were much poorer. So, you know, probably Poland is a good way to look at Eastern Europe. So what have we got? We got a great divergence or a little divergence? Well, by around 1700, the northwest corner of Europe had much higher per capita GDP than China or than other parts of Asia. But Northwest Europe also had higher per capita GDP than the other zones of Europe. Southern and Central and Eastern Europe, all except for Italy, had really per capita GDP that was really similar to, the, to China and the rest of Asia for most of the 18th century. And so what this means is that the puzzle is not so much Europe compared to Asia or Europe compared to China, it's Northwest Europe compared to everywhere else. So not just Asia, but also most of the rest of Europe. And that means our key question to try to understand the great divergence is probably maybe we should start looking at the little divergence inside Europe happening sometime before 1700. And the question is, what, how can we explain this? So this is the sort of quantitative basis for what a lot of economic and social historians are trying to do is that we think that if we can figure out why there's this huge divergence inside Europe in this key period, maybe that will shed light on what was going on with the great divergence between Europe and the rest of the world. So it's a sort of, um, you know, if we can, if we can understand this small problem well, it's not that small since it covers the entirety of Europe for 500 years, then we could understand the gigantic planetary problem a little bit better. So what I'd like to do is talk briefly about some of the approaches that economic historians have used to try to answer this question. And then in the second half of this interview, we can talk about what comes out of these different approaches. And I'm gonna talk about three different major approaches that have been used. I'll talk briefly about culture or mentalities now. Uh, in a second, on the next slide, I'll look at the question of resource endowments and geography. And then I will look at the question of institutions, of the sort of way in which people organize their societies. And I will look, I'm not going to say there's a monocausal explanation, but I think these are the three I don't think we have to choose between these three approaches, but realizing that they're the three main approaches can sort of narrow down our quest. So the first question is, to what extent can we say that economic divergence is caused by culture? Was there something about the cultural preferences of pre-modern people? Um, is there some that helps to explain underperformance or overperformance? You know, was there English individualism? Was there a sort of Mediterranean um, sort of, you know, siesta economy? Were there Eastern European sort of, you know, surf mentalities and so on? Traditional scholarship thought that pre-modern economies stagnated because pre-modern people didn't make rational economic choices. They thought differently. Uh, some versions think that pre-modern people, whether they're, uh, they were in the past or in present day less developed economies, uh, weren't interested in maximizing material well-being. Um, a very famous Russian um, uh, sociologist of peasants called Alexander Chayanov thought that Peasants, uh, whether in 19th century Russia or in the third world, did not calculate costs and hence they could not minimize them. Uh, they didn't have the concept of cost. They didn't place a price tag on the value of their time. Uh, they didn't 
like markets. They didn't understand money. There's a sort of sense that, you know, there's a different pre-modern mentality. If you don't have the modern mentality, maybe your economy won't um, expand. So one thing that we want to do as economic historians is think, to what extent is this true? Are there some cultures that are economically rational and others that are differently rational? And, you know, what kind of evidence would enable us to assess or answer this question? Because, you know, culture happens inside people's heads. Um, it's really hard to get at them. Are there ways of getting inside the way that people reason um, when it comes to economic things? Are there, are there forms of evidence we can use to find out about pre-modern people's economic preferences? I think there are. I've tried to do that. I've tried to look at the mentalities of Czech peasants in the 16th and 17th centuries, tried to in Bohemia, long way east in Europe. And I think there are ways we can get at people's economic mentalities, but we have to search out evidence, um, you know, on what's going on inside people's heads. And that's difficult. So a bunch of open questions. You know, does culture affect economic behavior? How much does it differ? How much does it explain under development or, or you know, sort of precocious development? Second um, explanations has to do with nature or ecology or geography. And it tries to look at the natural world. Were some countries, some societies rich because they had better resource endowments? So maybe they had more fertile soil. Um, remember, you know, probably 80% of pre modern GDP was created by agriculture, um, and hence soil fertility was pretty important. Um, what about fuel? Did coal endowments play a big role the way that Ken Pomerantz thought it did between in explaining European? Europe surpassing China. Um, what about mineral endowments? What what happened when you know um, the silver mines in the New World were began to be exploited by the Spanish monarchy? Is that something which played a determinative role for European economic growth in the period we're interested in? What about geography? Was it good to have a long coastline or a whole lot of navigable rivers? Um, are there sort of um, ways in which nature interacts with, with culture or with institutions. So is it maybe good to have a long coastline because it brings different cities into competition with one another so particular institutional forms like guilds can't have little local monopolies because there's always the guilds of another city are, are within reach. So there's an interplay between an interaction between geography and institutions. Um, similarly, you know, uh, silver endowments, did that in, in the new world, did that interact with state capacity in, in, in Spain to give rise to particular outcomes? And of course, a really um, kind of topical question is what role was played by, academ uh, by epidemics? Did the Black Death make societies richer or poorer? What about the 17th century plagues, which had much worse mortality in um, Germany and Italy, where, you know, in the, in the 1630s, be between 30 and 35 percent of the population were killed by plague, whereas in the Netherlands and England, it was like 10%, 15%. So, you know, was there a role that was being played by epidemics even in the 17th century? And finally, I mentioned institutions earlier. Institutions um, is not, we, we t I think in English we use institutions to refer to two types of things. One is something like, you know, the Bank of England or the University of Cambridge. And the other is institutions in the sense that I'm going to use them, which um, a, a, a very famous economic historian called Doug North uh, defined as the humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interaction. So they're kind of our rules and customs and expectations and norms that govern our, the way that we interact with each other, how we cooperate, how we penalize bad behavior, how we lower transaction costs. 
Basically, institutions are the parts of society as opposed to nature that create incentives for us to act in certain ways. So they might penalize deviations from norms, they might facilitate cooperation, so they enable us to get together and manage environmental uh, resources, or they might decrease transaction costs. The thing is that institutions can be either good or bad for the economy. Um, some forms of deviance are actually what you might call innovative. Um, maybe if nobody had ever deviated, we wouldn't have gotten a lot of, you know, pr productivity enhancing innovations. Or some forms of cooperation can be harmful. You just have to think about, you know, monopolies and collusion and mafias and stuff like that. So institutions potentially can play a big role in how we act because really we just accept the institutions around us. It's really difficult to change them. We're just born into the ones or we migrate into ones and we deal with them. Institutions we have discovered differed a lot across pre-modern Europe and maybe those institutions differences can help us explain this great this the great and little divergences that took place in the economy in this period and so what I'd like to do and this is I promised my last slide um, so I think we're just about on time uh, is to pose some open questions about historical institutions um, one of the major institutions that prevailed across a lot of central and Eastern Central and Nordic Europe, even in the early modern period, was serfdom. Um, the Northwest of Europe and the South of Europe um, had gotten out of serfdom a bit earlier around the Black Death or shortly thereafter. But the question is, did serfdom matter? So serfdom in the general sense of really strong institutional powers of landlords over the rural population. Um, we know there was this second serfdom, the intensification of landlord powers after about 1500-1550 in Central and Eastern Europe. Did that matter? Uh, why did it last so long? Why was it the 19th century until serfdom was abolished across much of Central and Eastern Europe? And in the end, why did it decline? How do we explain this? Um, a second institution which was really important all over Europe in this period are village communities. They mattered a lot because of agriculture. Remember I said 80% of GDP comes out of agriculture. The main thing peasants did was they lived in villages and they formed communities and those communities did things. So understanding what communities did, whether they were good or bad or in what ways they were good and in what ways they were bad is really important. And actually I think it's a bit understudied. Um, were towns and cities, so a different sort of community, urban communities, were they always centers of economic dynamism? Or do you actually have a sort of dead hand of stagnant cities as a blight on the countryside, which you do see in some parts of Europe during this period? We tend to think in the West, oh yeah, London, Paris, and so on. What about Berlin? What about, you know, the great cities that were allowed to coerce their countrysides in, in the east and, and center of Europe. What about guilds? I've written a lot about guilds. There's a big debate about guilds. Uh, some argue that they actually did some good things for the economy. They were good for apprenticeship and training, quality control. Others among the me would put more emphasis on their sort of exclusionary activities, the ways that they monopolized. Um, the non-inclusive aspects, the ways they kept women out of the economy, they discriminated against Jews, they discriminated against migrants. So guilds are complex occupational organizations that we need to know more about. What about the family? The family is an institution. There are arguments about whether maybe um, the nuclear family is better for development than the extended family or stem family, the various other families that you see in the world. Um, and there's a big argument about whether, you know, maybe there's something about having nuclear, the nuclear family system, which helped Northwest Europe. Um, the state. Economists are very excited about the concept of state capacity. There's a huge economics literature about it. Um, the state can do a lot of things to um, 
correct market failure, but the state, as we know, can also do bad things like wage gigantic wars and use up, you know, 90% of state of public expenditures, which is, you know, on war, which is the statistic we all know about. So what was the economic role of state capacity? Um, you know, do states do good, on balance good things or on balance bad things? for economic growth during the period we're interested in. And of course, the market is an institution. So what role did the market play given that it was surrounded by all of these other institutions? Um, a lot of these questions are still open. And that's really the kicking off place for the rest of you is you know, not just the questions about institutions, but the questions about resources and the questions about culture and the whole question of why do we see this divergence going on um, in Europe after 1500, with parts of it growing really fast and parts of it stagnating. So um, over to you guys. Brilliant, thank you very much, Professor Ogilvy. That was a really fascinating introduction to what I think is perhaps one of the most dramatic sort of global economic trends certainly over the past sort of half millennium or so, or even before that, depending, of course, on how you define it. Um, I'd like to kick off with the first question. Um, with everything that we've just discussed taken into account, um, I appreciate this is quite broad. Um, so if you just want to talk about a few factors, that's absolutely fine. But what do you think were some of the key things that really pushed um, Northwest Europe into becoming um, so much more economically um, sort of wealthy compared to other parts of Europe and indeed the wider world? That's a really good question. And um, as you can probably tell, I don't think I would say, yes, there's one thing. I, I really, mm -hmm. I, I would like to think that there was a sort of patent recipe and you could just say, you know, you could derive a lesson from history from Northwest Europe and then you could patent it and send it out to Africa and the poorer parts of Asia and so on and say, all you need is X. Um, and you know there are there are ways in which history is used by you know organizations like the World Bank and so on to say well you know all you need are parliaments or all you need is you know social capital or you know it, 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 there's usually some lesson from history which um, which makes its way into the policy makers agenda. I actually I think I think development is really difficult. Economic growth is extremely difficult. It took a really long time in Northwest Europe. So we kind of telescope it by looking at these graphs and we think, oh yeah, you can see a lot of growth going on. You know, five centuries passed and economic growth was really slow. It was way slower than it is in the modern developing world. So um, I don't think there was one thing that just did the trick. I think that there were some parts of Europe that were kind of lucky where a bunch of things came together. Um, I think that having a early decline of serfdom was a really good thing. It didn't work by itself because there are parts of very, there are very, very stagnant areas of Central Europe, one of which I studied as a graduate student a really long time ago. Um, uh, I studied this remote valley in the Black Forest of Southwest Germany, where they um, there were a bunch of weavers. I mean, there was a lot of rural weaving. There was a sort of proto-industry. And they had rural guilds, which was really very interesting. And they had very early proto-industry, but it stagnated for like, you know, 400 years. And this part of Germany was one of the latest to industrialize. It was really poor. It was really, really, um, not a success story. And yet it actually had lost serfdom by, you know, the 15th century. So it, was, it, it had no serfdom. In fact, it completely lost landlords. It had no landlord. It had a really strong parliament. So a parliament is another thing where they often say, well, your England had the mother of parliaments. The Netherlands had a, you know, parliaments on every level. So the Netherlands had a national parliament and then they had parliaments for each of the provinces of the Netherlands. Zotenberg, this part of Germany I studied, had a really strong parliament. So, you know, I don't think it can have been parliaments. So I don't think there's one thing that matters. And getting rid of serfdom early is not a magic bullet, but it's pretty good. 
So I think that one thing that England and the Netherlands benefited from was the Netherlands, actually the Northern Netherlands, never really had big landlords. So they didn't have these coercive powers to extract forced labor and from the peasants and stop them from migrating and require them to get you know, marriage permits and so on. England had that, but um, my English colleagues tell me that already before the Black Death, you see serfdom weakening a bit in England. And after the Black Death, it disappears really fast. So the Black Death killed off a lot of workers and um, the landlords tried to respond by coercing workers more and extracting more forced labor and the workers just blew them off. Um, and uh, so it was partly because the landlords in England did not get support from the state. So they, tr they passed laws and the workers just paid no attention at all, demanded higher wages, they migrated. It's a great, it's a sort of liberation story. So that was very good. The Netherlands and England lost serfdom early. After the Black Death in Central and Eastern Europe, things went in the exact opposite direction and the landlords did manage to get the state on their side and increase labor coercion. So after the Black Death in Eastern Europe, you actually get the second serfdom. After the Black Death in Western Europe, you get the decline. So getting that decline and not having the state support powerful existing extractive institutions is good. Um, I think the Netherlands and England really benefited from that. But if you were to ask me why, I, it would almost be a description. I would say, well, the landlords tried to behave like extractive, horrible, you know, normal big landlords did, and they failed. And that was great. And, you know, the state did not have the capacity to help them. But, you know, then that just pushes the question back and says, why didn't the state help them? So I think not having serfdom from an early date is very good because it increases the productivity of agriculture. I actually do think that on balance, even though occupational guilds did some good things like training people, they also did some bad things. And the state in England and the Netherlands stopped supporting the monopolies of powerful guild masters pretty early after about 1500, 1550. So that's a good thing. So you can see that there's a sort of pattern whereby there, I think there's a tendency of ordinary people to try to be productive and innovative and, you know, fuel economic growth. And then there's a countervailing tendency of powerful groups to try to redistribute, you know, good things to themselves and coerce ordinary people. And it's sort of the balance between those two. And I don't think there was anything specially virtuous about Northwest Europe. I think we were, well, not we, because I'm Canadian, but um, people in Northwest Europe were very lucky back in the 16th century that the um, tendency of powerful groups to manipulate institutions, to redistribute resources to themselves and away from ordinary people tended to fail. But it took, you know, it wasn't that life was lovely in the 16th century. It took until the 19th or 20th century for things. To, so, you know, I, I think that's a very long answer to your question, but it was a very big question. <laughs> absolutely, that's fair enough. And it's absolutely incredible. Like, I think, as you say, it's fascinating how these two, I suppose, very remote bits of Northwest Europe were able to develop, like, over these periods of time. And it can look very impressive when you see it on a graph, but actually it was a real process. And I imagine that it was quite challenging for them to get to that point. Um, following on from that, of course, I think one, I suppose one common argument that would be made for that is the fact that, of course, in the 17th century, the Netherlands um, were able to have this enormous kind of trade network, um, various colonies in different places. And that's something, of course, that Britain replicated to extraordinary I don't think I'll quite say tremendous I don't necessarily want to put a positive spin on it but you know to quite a staggering effect going forward into the 19th century and really after that um do you think necessarily that having like lots of trade resources and lots of land and routes like that necessarily makes some places wealthy or do you think there's more to it than that I imagine it's probably the latter but what would be your opinion I think that 
long distance trade is very, it's sort of glamorous and it's very well recorded. So we tend to look at it and it's also associated with, with dramatic and terrible events like the enslavement of many millions of Africans mm. and civil wars about the enslavement of people and colonialism. So it's got, it's really very, very high profile. But I think the size of long distance trade relative to the rest of economic activity was incredibly small, be, even during the 19th century, but certainly before the 19th century. So the period that we're interested in as early modernists, during which a lot of the action was taking place as we saw on those graphs, probably something less, well less than 5% of European GDP was traded across international borders. And that's even in before 1800. So that's even in, including inside Europe. So it's an incredibly small part of GDP, which is being sus subjected to these, you know, um, very dramatic, very glamorous and very terrible events. And consequently, I would need to be persuaded that, you know, somehow long distance trade and colonialism and everything bad that came with it was the key thing that made early modern Europe develop. I also, there, there is an argument, you would have to ask yourself, why is it that Europe did this? And the answer might be, well, the European economy, European economy was already developing enough to finance and support not just the long tra distance trading expeditions, but also the navy, navies and armies that did all of these terrible things in other continents. Or actually, I have to say, as a Canadian, did not so terrible things. But you know, even even in Canada, there were things that the Europeans did that were pretty bad. Um, so, you know, I think it's just, A, it's quantitatively not large enough to have caused the little divergence, and B, that very small part of European economic activity, which was involved in long distance trade and colonies and, and so on, you have to ask yourself, why, why was it Europe that did this? That could have been China, it could have been any other part of the world. Why did this happen? And the answer which a number of people who have studied it have given is maybe it was because Europe was already developing both the markets, so the sort of market economy, but unfortunately also, you know, this state capacity, the dark, you know, and the thing about state capacity is that it needs a rich economy to pay a lot of, you know, um, taxes into the coffers of states that then do somewhat terrible things with them. So, you know, this long distance trade, um, to the extent that it was supported by naval and military action, was also parasitic on there being a productive economy, there being economic growth happening in the domestic economy. So on the whole, I would emphasize you know, domestic activity, you know, sort of, you know, agriculture, proto-industry, short distance trade between town and countryside, interregional trade inside Europe, but the long distance trade was sort of the foam on the surface of the waves, as Fernand Baudet would put it. I see, that's really fascinating. I mean, certainly as a lay person going into this topic, I would have thought that that would have been front and centre, but it's really interesting that actually, you know, when you look at the figures, it was almost modelled, in fact, could even sort of take away from local growth and development. That's really fascinating. Um, one thing which I'd also be quite interested in, um, in terms of growth, um, was there any role in things like financial institutions, like say banking or insurance and things like that? As I understand that that was already something that had been around in medieval Europe for quite a long time and certainly seemed to grow going into, as I understand, sort of the 18th century, maybe even before that. So did that have any particular influence at all, or was that also quite a limited area? That's a good question. I think the, again, we tend to know more about the high finance. So we know about the mm -hmm. Medici Bank, and we know about 
you know, the, the, the sort of foundation of the Bank of England in 1694. And we know about, again, the financing of larger enterprises and long distance trade. Because those, because those are, you know, especially the long distance trade is quantitatively small, I probably wouldn't emphasize so much the high finance. What I would emphasize though, and I think this comes out of um, actually a lot out of development economics. So um, the, 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 what we know about the way developing economies work in poorer parts of the world now, and then lo looking at early modern Europe with the same eye is what you might call microfinance in the sense that um, one of the reasons why agriculture began to grow in the Netherlands from the late 15th century onwards was because its agricultural sector became more productive. We tend to think the Netherlands, oh yes, long distance trading and so on. Actually, that was fueled by a preceding agricultural revolution. And then there were little agricultural revolutions all over Europe sequentially over the succeeding four or 500 years. And although they didn't need a lot of capital inputs, they needed little microfinance inputs. They needed people to be able to borrow a little bit of money in order to reorganize their crop rotation system or invest in better breeds of animals or introduce turnips or these incredibly boring, dirty handed things that people did. And I think microfinance, these, you know, um, little uh, sort of uh, often not really institutionalized credit networks that you begin to see in villages and small towns in England and the Netherlands from the late medieval period onwards and then increasingly in the 16th century, the, uh, especially in the Netherlands, what you observe is there are a lot of peasants being able to hold their savings in financial form in small savings institutions in the towns. You've even got peasants investing in, um, in sort of ship voyages and industrial enterprises as well as in their own farms. And these innovative forms of microfinance, I think probably did play a role. But again, we don't know that much about them. It's a bit like in 19th century Germany, we know a lot about the great universal banks and we don't know about the 80% of the financial sector, which was small banks, which we know probably helped finance enterprises, but nobody has actually looked at their balance sheets. So again, I would say, get behind the big sexy institution, financial institutions and look at where are peasants getting their, getting their finance from? What about proto-industrial enterprises? Were people only using retained earnings or were they actually borrowing a little bit and what institutions enable them to do that? And I think we, have little, there's a little sort of things come above the surface, like the tip of the iceberg, and you think, oh my God, this was going on. We don't know anything about it. One thing we can do, um, which I did a little bit of, is uh, inventories of what people own at marriage and death, like everything they own, sometimes list their, their financial instruments and the money that they owe. Once you start looking at the peasant inventories, you can see that nearly every peasant both owes money and is owed money. So there's this network of debt inside peasant communities going back at least to the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, one assumes that they were, you know, borrowing and lending and investing in their own farms and their own workshops. Knowing more about that, I think, is a huge open question for, for early modernists. Absolutely. I think it would be fascinating to do some more work in that particular area, because I think, as you say, like, it's so easy to focus on the really high end stuff, like, I don't know, say, Edwards III, like, you know, putting the body bank out of business or whatever. But actually looking at sort of individual transactions and how people work within the financial system, I think, is really fascinating. And I think, as you rightfully say, it would be fantastic if some more research could be done on that. Um, just a follow up question. Is this a particularly new field or is it quite developed? And what do you think needs to be done to kind of 
grasp with this kind of idea of microfinance a bit more sort of within this period? I think that looking at finance and the role of finance in economic development is pretty, or you know, historical economic development has a long and distinguished history. I think that looking at the modest, humble financial dealings of ordinary people has less of a long history and is kind of a, a sort of frontier area as far as, as you know, economic history of the next generation is concerned. So um, the there are a lot of really unused sources. I mentioned already peasant inventories. There, um, there are, you know, thousands of them lying in village archives all over Europe. They give you a lot of information. I mean, they, they not only give you information about financial instruments of modest people, where you find, for instance, that women are really a lot involved in these microcredit markets. Um, but there are the records of things like pawn shops and village money lenders and town money lenders. There are provincial banks. I think even in England, I think the last book that was written about the activities of provincial banks in England during the Industrial Revolution was written, I think, in the 1950s. So it's time for someone to go. And, you know, it was a great book, but it just has these really suggestive things where it says, well, you know, there were these provincial regional banks and there were networks of regional attorneys in the north of England who were mediating, lending and borrowing for the first factories, and we don't know anything about it. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked when I realize we still don't know anything about it. And yet, you know, there are documents in archives all over the place which would enable people to do it. So I think, you know, going in with some of the things we've learned from our friends, the development economists, um, and I, the reason that I'm very acutely aware of that is that for 31 years in Cambridge I actually taught development economics so it was like half my job and I realized that mm -hmm. the questions economists ask about third world countries are exactly the same questions we ask about early modern European or indeed any other economies. There are um, for other for not outside Europe there are debt contracts surviving for uh, China back into the 18th century, which is something I did not know until one of my graduate students uh, discovered that there were all of these debt contracts for China that had been held in families, and then the families had, had sort of held them for hundreds of years, and they're now being digitized. And they give exact details on the amount of the of the loan, what the collateral was, what what you know, what what it was going supposed to be used for, the identity of the borrower and the lender, who the guarantors were. So you know, because you needed some sort of guarantee that the borrower was going to pay, pay it back, and so that you then look. My 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 student was trying to analyze: Did people use? Did people buy and borrow and lend only from family members, or did they also do it outside the family? And he found they did it outside the family, but what they used family members for was to act as their guarantors. So that whole question of how peasant borrowing and lending works, we could actually compare debt contracts in early modern Europe with debt contracts in early modern China and begin to say something about the differences and similarities between China and Europe. So I think this is going to be a really huge growth area in the next generation. I'm, if I would be so excited to be your age and, you know, have that to work mm -hmm. on. Oh, I would hope so. Absolutely. I mean, and the thought as well of like comparing debt contracts between, say, early modern Europe and early modern China and seeing the similarities and things, that's absolutely incredible. I think I'll say now, this is an absolute clarion call for any sort of economic students out there who are interested in doing a PhD or anything. Like, this is an absolute treasure trove and certainly worth diving into. It's, yeah, that's fascinating. And I do hope that yeah. we get some more stuff on that going ahead. Fantastic. Um, perhaps focusing away to another topic. Um, another thing I was really fascinated by in your discussion was the idea that urban centres 
could have a negative effect in some parts of Europe on economic growth. Of course, I think, again, speaking as a, you know, as a relative layperson interested in economics, I think we often tend to associate urban centers as hallmarks of economic sophistication. But I'd be fascinated to hear, like, what were perhaps some examples of towns where it would have a negative effect and it would actually stymie sort of local and broader economic growth? So in, in general, I think we economists tend to think that cities are good places. And there's a lot of evidence for the modern world that are there are things that are called sort of urban agglomeration economies. So if you bring a lot of people together in one place, they not only are as productive as they are as individuals, but because there are other productive individuals in the same city, they benefit from spillover effects from each other. So if there are a bunch of other, you know, whether it's whether it's it's London or Mexico City or Beijing or Paris, having a lot of other smart, productive, inventive, educated people in the same place, they kind of, you know, learn from one another and they buy each other's things and they work for one another. And you know, you know if you have a little startup that you'll be able to find, you know, other innovative, hardworking people who will work for you. And you and you know also there's probably the spillover of, you know, they're nice places to go for coffee. And you know, it's generally a buzzy kind of place. So we know there are these urban agglomeration economies. And we think they probably existed in the past as well. There's no reason why they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But the thing that is mostly, but not entirely missing in modern cities, is that cities in the past also had coercive institutions sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for instance, in an early modern city, depending on which part of Europe it was in, you might be allowed to immigrate into it from the countryside. So you're a smart young woman or man from the countryside, you want to go to the city to earn you, you know, to seek your fortune, you move into the city. If it's a really, really strict city, it won't even let you move in, or it will let you move in and be a laborer, but it won't let you become a, become a citizen. Citizenship rights were, were held in the community rather than the country until quite late on in European history. And if you weren't a citizen of a town, there were lots of kinds of work you weren't allowed to do. So you couldn't, you know, work in a lot of crafts and trades. You kind of had to remain part of the proletariat. You would never be able to set up a workshop or become a member of a guild. You had to get citizenship rights. Mm -hmm. And so there was, depend, there, especially in Central Europe, in the Nordic countries and in Eastern Europe, being allowed to not just bring your own skills and entrepreneurship into a city, but actually realize them, actually be able to set up a little business or work in a particular sector was often regulated by, you know, sort of restrictive institutions of various sorts. So that was one thing is that some, some cities were very much in the hands of these sort of privileged, you know, merchant and, and small business groups who didn't want to let outsiders in. And that was one problem. And another problem is that cities, city, in order to have a city, you needed to be able to feed the populace. Mm -hmm. And there are two ways of doing that. One is to pay market prices for the food and it sort of attract the surrounding peasantry to come in and sell food in your markets. And then there's the other approach, which is to force the surrounding peasantry to sell food in your markets at prices laid down by the urban authorities. And some parts of Europe did the latter. And it has been argued that that was one of the many sources of um, economic stagnation in many sort of Mediterranean societies in the early modern period was that the Italian and Spanish cities tried to force the peasants in the surrounding countryside to supply them with food, which sounds good if you are a city dweller, but what kind of incentives does it set up if you're an Italian peasant or a Spanish peasant? Mm -hmm. So 
it's actually better to pay market prices. Um, and that was what Amsterdam and England did. So Kent became the sort of breadbasket of London, really from the 15th century onwards. Um, a lot of the gigantic churches that you see in Kentish villages come from that time when, you know, London had this, you know, unassuageable um, demand for food and beer, and it was all coming up from Kent. Um, the same was true in, around Amsterdam. There was, you know, this huge area of, of productive agriculture, which was supplying Amsterdam. So in, in cities which tried to coerce the surrounding countryside, you tend to get a sort of urban blight where, you know, you get, you get a lot of deserted villages in, in Spain, you get a lot of very impoverished peasants around Italian cities. You, in Eastern Europe, the cities sometimes actually encircled the surrounding peasants. So there's a, a, a city of, um, in Western Bohemia in the Czech Republic called Cheb, which had, which was actually a feudal overlord itself. So the city itself had serfs in the surrounding villages and extracted coerced labor from them. So there were all sorts of ways in which cities then counteracted their positive agglomeration economies by behaving in these incredibly, you know, exclusionary and coercive ways. And in that sense, I think looking at the dark side of cities and realizing there are good cities and bad cities. There are good urban policies and bad ones. And uh, you know, some of the bad policies you see at work in Africa today, there were African cities, certainly as late as the 70s or 80s, that were trying to keep grain prices down for the urban populace. And you can see why you would do that because they don't want bread riots, but it was really bad for the surrounding peasantry. And I remember reading about those, those policies and saying, they tried that in 17th century Spain and it was a bad idea then, and it's still a bad idea now. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, not all cities are created equal. There are, you know, cities which have this very, you know, they have a hugely dynamic effect on their hinterland. And then there are cities that actually, you know, try to coerce their hinterland or prevent ent rural enterprises that compete with urban enterprises. Um, and obviously you want the former rather than the latter. Absolutely, absolutely. That's really fascinating just to sort of see how that plays out. Well, um, it's one of the, <laughs> I feel as if I've spent a lot of my life studying stagnant economies where things go really wrong. So, you know, German-speaking Central Europe, then I went and did a lot of work on Czech history in the early modern period. And, you know, they're not success stories. But I think by looking at where things went wrong in early modern Europe, you see things about England and the Netherlands and you say, well, I can't say exactly what they're doing right, but I know there's some certain things that were terrible in these stagnant economies and you know, figuring out why those mistakes were not being made by Amsterdam or by London is a first step. It may simply be you know, refraining from bad things is a good way, you know, it clears the way for economic growth. It may not actually make you invent a steam engine, but it makes it possible that if someone invents a steam engine, it will be introduced rather than, you know, sort of um, prohibited in some way by mm -hmm. some landlord or some, you know, guild or city or something. Absolutely, absolutely. It pains me to say that it come, that we're now coming to the end of our session tonight, which is an absolute shame. Like. There are many, many more questions to ask, but um, we won't take up any more Professor Ogilvy's time. I have to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. It's been incredible, some of the things that we've talked about, some of the assumptions that we've challenged. It's been really good. So thank you so much for your time this evening, Professor. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you very much to everybody well, watching. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And, you know, if any of the things we've talked about inspires you, go off and do some research on it nearly all the interesting questions are still open. Absolutely. And on that note, we'll say okay. yes, please, please do continue to research, please do continue to be curious, and hope you join us for the next episode. Thank you very much, and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.